Hello, good afternoon. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is, um, can everybody hear me up the back if I don't use the mic? Yeah, yeah. welcome if you want to. Um, is to give you basically the, the academic background to sustainability and what this idea of sustainability is so we can engage in a conversation later on through the other speakers using basically the same language and getting everybody up to the, the same level of knowledge. So what I'm about to do is really try and distill what we deliver to master's students over 13 weeks into 15 minutes. So a bit of a challenging task but we'll see how we go. But, um, as Tony said, I've got a background in environmental engineering and more specifically in, in water resources engineering. I was also lucky enough to be part of the team that worked with Councillor Young and the other councillors here at Gold Coast City Council early on when they started shifting the focus of the organisation from a development focused council towards this greener and more sustainable path. So I've had experience there with the Queensland Environment Protection Agency, engineering consulting, more recently, um, as Tony said, uh, with the University of Queensland in the, the research and teaching area. Like any good academic, we'll start with the definition. And Councillor Young touched on this um, Brundtland Commission report from 1987. Take a moment just to read the definition, and then I want to know if any of you violently object to the wording that's there. And by violently object, I mean not, oh, maybe they could have mentioned this or maybe they could have mentioned that. If you have a fundamental disagreement with what this definition of sustainable development is trying to do. So we have a show of hands. Who, who fundamentally objects to it? So we've got no hands, which is the typical response. We move to an international Sort of definition down to a national level here in Australia. We've got a, a similar statement, similar words, getting across this idea of being able to meet current needs while also being able to meet similar needs into the future. So again, I put the question to you. Any violent objections? The very last word increased, does that take into account finite resources? So it's a very good question. Um, yes or no? And it highlights one of the problems with these definitions. And they're developed by committees. So literally hundreds of people working for months to come up with something that everybody agrees in terms of what is sustainability. And this drives all of the current thinking in terms of policy development, business change, uh, personal change in the environmental and sustainability area. They're great words, but what does it actually mean for you as business owners? How are you going to try and implement something like that? A very noble goal into your businesses and into your daily lives. It's a challenging thing. That's the first message I'd like to get across is this idea of sustainability seems very simple, very elegant, something that we can all sign up for and adapt to and move towards. But when we get to the, the hard and thrust sort of parts of trying to implement it, it's incredibly challenging because it's complex. And that sort of spelt out by the range of literature that's out there. Um, millions, well, thousands of books on the subject which promote the idea of sustainability in slightly different ways. Likewise, there's an enormous amount of data out there now. Um, you can't see most of the logos on the slides here, but a lot of them are government departments of the CSIRO. This is sort of the reading list that you have to do this master's course that I was talking about earlier. And there's the emerging media. So the material that's online in terms of videos, MP3 downloads, online discussion. The message I want to get across here is that it's a rapidly evolving area with a lot of opinions and something that hasn't been bedded down and isn't um, something that's business as usual yet. We're still in the early stages of development of this idea of sustainability. If there's one thing that I'd get across to you in 15 minutes about what is sustainability, what drives it and what's important, it's this chart here which on the x-axis, along the bottom, is showing the years from about 10,000 BC all the way through to the present day. The um, y-axis is the world population in millions. And what you can see is for most of our history, we've had a population of under 1 million people. Starting around the 17 and 1800s, we started to rapidly increase up to the point where the black line ends, which was really 
where we started to have meaningful measurements of population on the planet, around about 1950. <coughs> and what, what you can see is it's like a brick wall. Population, as you move through time, suddenly exploded on this planet. And that's the number one thing that's driving environmental pressures at the moment. The, the extension up the top is the predicted population by 2050. So if most of you look at that chart, pick the year that you were born, so sort of move forward in time and you know, have a look at where you might want to depart this world, population will have more than doubled during that period of time, which puts an enormous burden on the planet. If we look at that spatially, top map is about 1800, if we look at population density. China, Europe, um, England, you know, pretty dense places. Move forward to 1960, those areas are growing slightly. Move forward again in time, 1990, and then the projections into 2050. Our near neighbours in China, Southeast Asia, and Southern Asia are going to be the areas where there's going to be enormous population explosions, increases in pressures on natural resources and ecosystems, and also, as Councillor Young pointed out, enormous opportunities to get in and help our new neighbours in terms of working with them with technology services to meet these challenges. What's the result of all of that? Well, I could have shown one of a hundred different slides here, but what I've shown here is deforestation rates in the Brazilian Amazon from 1988 through to 2010. So the years are along the, the x-axis at the bottom, the y-axis shows the amount of deforestation in square kilometres per year. And so you can see back in about 1995, we had a peak around 28,000 square kilometres cleared in one year. Well, to put it in perspective, that's an area roughly the size of Hawaii, gone in one year. We can see this decreasing trend as more regulations come into play and we're looking after our forests in a lot better way. So it shows that we have the capacity for change we can move in the right direction. But we're still clearing, you know, around about five, 6,000 square kilometres a year, and just in the Brazilian Amazon, not a global figure. To put that in perspective, if you're watching the Rugby World Cup final this weekend, five, 6,000 square kilometres is roughly 700,000 rugby fields. So enormous areas that are being modified or changed every year. As I said, I could have shown you anything. Decline in fisheries. Um, loss of, you know, what we call charismatic megafauna or nice, cute, cuddly, cuddly creatures. Anything would have shown you a similar trend. And really it's brought about because of our need for stuff. To drive our modern economies in their current state, to fuel that population and give everybody the standard of living that we're aspiring to, requires an enormous amount of resources. And that has got us to the point where we are today, where issues about environmental degradation, issues about sustainability are becoming the things that we need to meet. It's sort of the, the big challenge of modern times. Why is it such a big challenge? Well, this is how we tr typically try and present the argument in a classroom. If we have time on an x-axis and some measure of our available resources on the planet on the y-axis. Because we have technological gains which allow us to increase our efficiency of resource use, the, the actual amount of resources available to us on one planet Earth slowly increases over time. <coughs> but we've got this situation with population at the moment where our population is rapidly increasing to the point where we will eventually overshoot the resources on the planet. And if we follow population biology from you know, common things that we're able to um, investigate, bacteria, insect populations, we typically overshoot and then have a population crash typical pattern that we see time and time again in natural systems. If we're bacteria or we're insects, we'll literally do the same thing again. We're humans, we have the capacity to think and change our behaviour. So what we're hoping will happen is we will avoid that crash and we'll move to some sort of sustainable setting where the population's resource use is below the limits set by the planet. An alternative view, one that's held by a lot of technologists and the scientists and engineers that I typically work with day in, day out, is that technological changes give us sort of step increases in the amount of resources that we have, which if you follow it through means that as our population increases, we should have step changes in technology which allow us to survive. Two, two opposing arguments, if you like. Where are we? Well, 
It's probably a combination of both. We've definitely had changes in technology which have allowed us to use resources more efficiently. But we've also had huge explosions in population, which we saw in previous slides, which have led us to this situation here, which um, is ecological footprint analysis, which was done back in 2007. Who's familiar with this sort of work? Hands up, a few notes. Yep. What the figure is showing is through time, from 1970 through to 2050, if we look at resource consumption to drive our populations on this planet, and we apportion that in terms of the amount of area needed to supply our resources, clean, um, you know, clean water, clean air, productive agriculture, things like that. By about 2007, we were using about one and a half times the world's biocapacity. So we were overusing our resources or, or digging into our natural capital which got us to the point where we either needed to correct our action to get our use under one planet, or as many pretty eminent scientists and engineers have pointed out, we need to find other planets to colonise. And Stephen Hawking, a famous physicist, is convinced that our only way out of our current mess is the other option, find more planet Earths that we can move to. And he's not usually known as a guy that makes comments flippantly. Um, so it, it's quite interesting that that's the conclusion that he's reached. I don't share his view on an optimist in this case. The other point is this idea of sustainability is not new. If we start our timeline back in the, the BC era, issues about the environment were really current back then. And we actually had what was referred to as the king and emperor's laws to prevent deforestation, look after forests so that we had them sustainably manage to provide wood products into the future. If we move through almost every era from that time through to the 1940s, 1960s, we've had some major environmental theme or crisis come along. In our modern era, through the 60s, 70s and 80s, we had a lot of large environmental disasters which made headlines around the world. In the new millennium, we entered this era of sustainability, or thinking about sustainability in a, in a very um, profound and meaningful way. And if we look into the future, the big things on the horizon are climate change and this idea of what is sustainability. There's a general agreement that we need to move to a sustainable track, but we still don't quite know what it is. So again, take away the message, these things aren't new. What makes it different this time around is, for the first time in our history, our population and our technology is combined to a point that we're actually able to completely change and reshape our biosphere, <coughs> which we've never had that capability as a, a species before on this planet, which means while we've faced past environmental issues um, and pretty serious ones, we're at a point now where the scale of things is well beyond anything that it's been at before. We're, we're currently using the resources of one and a half times the planet. So we're, we're in serious territory. But we've started to do things about that. So if we look at um, a chart of the amount of Australian environmental legislation from pre-1970 all the way through to 2000, we can see that we had this increasing trend right up to the 1990s. Now this is just federal level or commonwealth level legislation and state level legislation. And we went through an era where we locked things up. We tried to protect things through national parks and we tried to put limits on pollution, which got us through to the 1990s, yet we've got this drastic decline in 2000, which was really where we came up against this idea of sustainability and how to legislate for it. And it is one of the big challenges that we're still struggling with at the moment, even with the the new climate change uh, legislation that's just passed Parliament. But if we look at where it's heading in terms of new legislation, there's this, <coughs> sorry, this idea of triple bottom line, which many of you have come across, I'm sure. And that is that from here on in, we're not thinking about environmental issues in isolation. If we take the environmental sphere and the economic sphere, for both of those to work properly, we need to find a middle ground where, in, where we are environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable to have a viable system. We also introduce a third sphere or the social sphere into this sustainability argument. So if we consider social and environmental issues, where we're sustainable in, in both areas, we have what's called a variable system. 
Likewise, with social and economic systems, if we're sustainable in both realms there, we have equitable systems. But when we move into the middle where we consider social, environmental and economic things all together, this forms the foundation of our current thinking of what is sustainability. So it's moved beyond environmental sustainability to this idea that we need to be economically sustainable, socially sustainable, as well as environmentally sustainable. What do I mean by that? Well, economics most of you will know about. You're all good business people. Profits, monetary flow, jobs created. Environment, we've talked a little bit about. You know, air quality, water pollution, waste production, energy use issues that you're all familiar with. More esoteric or harder to pin down in terms of the sustainability equation is the social dimension. And this is where a lot of the research and development is happening at the moment. And that is looking at what do we mean by sustainable labour practices, community impacts, human rights, product responsibility. So the message to take away is there's three <coughs> spheres that we need to consider when we're talking about sustainability in the modern era. So where does that put us in a broad sequence in time? If we look through time and we look at ecosystem health on the y-axis, pre that explosion in population, we had pretty good ecosystem health. Low populations, viable biospheres, everything was reasonably well off on the planet from a biological point of view. Then with that increase in population, we went through a decline in that biocapacity, and we're in this era now where we're trying to halt that decline and move to a sustainable setting. What isn't talked about when we talk about this idea of sustainability is the next phase. And so this should give you hope in terms of where the policy bureaus are thinking of moving into the future. And that is beyond sustainability into a regeneration phase, where once we understand what sustainability is and we've achieved that, we'll actually look at restoring or repairing a lot of the damage that we've done. But that hinges on us being able to halt that decline before we go through some minimum sustainable level. And at the moment, that's where a lot of the research and um, investigation that I and my colleagues are involved in is trying to work out where that line is. Is it somewhere below where we are at the moment or have we already shot below it and are we looking at a, a future state where we're just moving into some lower form of existence in terms of the, the biosphere and where we are at on the planet? So, that's the bigger picture of, of where we are, where we've come from, the, the ideas behind it all. It's a complex area, and in terms of looking to the future, what can you do as business owners and business people here in the Gold Coast? Well, if there's one thing that we can all agree on in the sustainability field, is the need for metrics, or to be able to measure the performance of anything that we do. And there's a range of different things that have been developed, range of different indicators, range of different metrics that have been put out, all of which we could talk about for, for hours and hours, days and days. But the point being, every single one of these different methods that are, are scrolling up on the screen, as well as the literature that's coming out on this, all agrees that to start this move towards sustainability, the first step or the first part of that track is understanding and documenting what you're doing in your business. And you'll hear from speakers later on that will talk to you in a lot more detail about how you can go about that and why it's important. But the message from me in terms of where we're heading in terms of sustainability and regulation of that in the future is that you will need to start to be able to measure and account for what you're doing in a lot greater detail than you are now. What do I mean by all that? And this is sort of wrapping up. And I was really excited to see one of my favourite tea companies outside. I've got two, two options here for you to pick. One is coffee, one is tea. Um, can I have a hands up? Who, who would designate themselves as a coffee drinker? So, and who would select tea? So as usual, it's a 50-50 pick. If I was to ask you now to bet on what uses more water to produce, tea or coffee? Coffee. coffee. One cup of coffee, about 140 litres of water versus tea, 35 litres of water. So if we're looking at water consumption alone, tea gets the big tick here. And I'm very pleased to say that with our, our tea company outside. Um, but what I'm getting at in terms of metrics is to be able to distill information about your company or your business or your product into something that's readily accessible to consumers like this. 
and this is where we're heading. You've, you've all seen the, the dietary labels that tell you fat and energy content in your food you buy in the supermarket. Where we're probably heading with sustainability metrics is similar labels to give you information about the water, energy, waste associated with each of the products that you consume or purchase. So to sum up, and I know I've gone over time and I apologise for that, we've got a long proud history of understanding different environmental issues, but when it comes to this idea of sustainability, a quick search on the internet, if you do a Google search for an image using the keyword sustainability, you'll get a thousand different images popping up which are different people's concepts of what sustainability is. And it's a good point to end on because it is an evolving field and one that's going to require a lot of work from here into the future. But the starting point and one of the points I'll leave you with, again, is this idea of metrics. We're going to need to measure what we do so we can understand it and start improving things. Thank you very much.